And uh, all right. Name of the Father and the Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the gift of life and the gift of faith. Help us to grow in our love for you every day. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I'm just so happy to be with you all again today. Praise the Lord. Here we go. What uh, day 25, what was Isaac going to give Esau before he died? His special blessing. And with it went the birthright. Uh, who inspired Jacob to trick Isaac? Rebecca. Uh, why'd she do that? Because she liked Jacob the best, huh? Name three ways that Jacob tricked Isaac. He fixed goat meat to make it taste like deer meat. He put the goat skins on his arms to make him feel hairy like uh, Esau. And he wore Esau's clothes to make himself smell like Esau. What did Jake, number four, what did Jacob receive from Isaac? His blessing and along with it, the birthright. Number five, what was Esau's immediate reaction when he found out about the trick? Bitter sobbing. He's just crying. He's sobbing. Father, bless me too. But he said, I can't. I, I gave my word. It's done. You know, they, they, they couldn't take it back. And um, so it was, he was very sad. And in our last lesson, I said that he is a prefigurement. Uh, Esau and his sadness prefigures the, the pain and the anguish and the suffering of all those people who someday are going to uh, be at the last judgment at the end of the world, and they're going to be sent to hell when they could have had heaven if they had done what was right, and even when they did what was wrong, even when they committed a sin, if they had asked God for mercy, they could have still been saved, but um, they refused to do that. And so they're going to have everlasting pain and suffering, and it's all their own fault, uh, just like Esau is, is suffering, and it's his own fault. He told Jacob, you can have my birthright. Uh, give me a bowl of that stew, and, and I'll give you my birthright. No, it's too bad. Um, what did, number six, what did Esau plan to do to Jacob? He was so angry, he's going to kill him after he thought about it for a while. He said, I'll, I'll kill my brother, and then I'll have all the inheritance for myself. No, not, not a good thought. Uh, where, to where did Jacob flee? He went to his uncle Laban's farm up in Haran. Uh, his mother is Rebecca, and Rebecca could see that Esau was really mad and that he planned to kill Jacob. So she told Jacob, get out of here. Your brother is so enraged, he, he's planning to kill you. And she said, go to my brother's house. That would be his uncle. Go to my brother uh, Laban's farm up in Haran. So that's what he did. He ran away. What did Jacob see in his dream? Well, he's traveling along. It took several days to get up there. And one night when he lay down, he had a dream and he saw a ladder or a stairway. When I was a kid, they said ladder. Today, the translations say stairway. Uh, uh, steps going up into heaven and angels going up and angels coming down. And um, he thought that was really something. In his dream, he saw this, this stairway into heaven. And, and when he woke up, he said, God must be in this place. This must be a holy place. And he named that place Bethel. 
Beth means house, and E-L, L, means God. So the, play, the name of that place is House of God. And that eventually, years later, became a town. And, and it will be a, a town that is mentioned many times in the Bible. What two things did God promise to do for Jacob? In his dream, God promised Jacob that he would give him all the land of Canaan and he would give it to his descendants forever. The same promise that he made to Abraham, that he made to Isaac, now he makes it to Jacob. You guys, you may know this, you may not know this. Those three people, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, are known as the patriarchs. I don't know if you've ever heard that term, patriarch. It means chief father. So these are the chief fathers, the main fathers of the Jewish people. It started with Abraham, and then his son Isaac, and then his son Jacob. Jacob's going to have 12 sons, and that's where you're going to get the 12 tribes of Israel from. But we're not there yet. So these three guys are known as the patriarchs. And um, how did Jacob mark this special place? He set up a memorial stone. He set up a stone there so he could find that place again. And uh, the stone would, would still be there. What did Jacob name that place? Bethel means house of God. What daughter of Laban did Jacob meet at the well? Well, when he got to Laban's farm, uh, there was a well there, and he stopped to get uh, the, a drink of water, and uh, there was a woman there, and her name is Rachel. And she's one of Laban's daughters. That would be his cousin. And he, um, he takes a liking to her, and we're going to see in the next story that he wants to marry Rachel, and we shall see what happens in our next episode. <laughs> okay, before we get to our next episode, what can we learn from today's lesson? Number one, parents should avoid showing favoritism to any particular child because it will lead to ill feelings in the family. You know, Rebecca favored Jacob, and she helped him trick Isaac, and that is what caused Esau to hate, uh, to hate uh, Jacob and, and want to kill him. It's, it's not good. Don't play favorites. If the parents play favorites, oh, it leads to bad feelings amongst the, the family members, and you don't want to do that. You want to love everybody equally. You want to treat everybody fairly. Sometimes a particular child needs more than others. My brother Allie had five kids, but one of them, uh, Aaron, he was born deaf. Okay? He could not hear at all. And so hearing and speaking was pretty impossible for him. Well, that's really hard. I mean, growing up deaf and unable to speak, that's, that's pretty tough. And so Linda spent a lot of time with him on his homework and on his schooling and taking him to special schooling. And, you know, she spent way more time with Aaron than she did with any of the other kids. Well, that's understandable. He had, a, he had a really bad handicap, and he needed it. That's okay. That's okay. But I had an uncle who had seven children, and when he died, he had a farm, and there was about 100 acres there. And today, 100 acres is worth where we live, 100 acres is worth around a million bucks. And so um, 
that's a sizable inheritance, isn't it? And um, seven kids, you would have thought he would have divided it up seven ways. But in his will, he gave the house and 60 acres to one boy. And he gave 40 acres, the rest of the farm, to another boy. And the first five, the oldest five kids got nothing. So it would be like one kid got 600,000, another kid got 400,000, and the other five kids got nothing. Do you think they were happy about that? They were not. It made for some bad feelings. Why did he do such a thing? Nobody knows. It was in his will. He was dead. You couldn't ask him. And it didn't say in the will, it just said, this boy gets this and this boy gets this. That's it. So we'll never know till we get to the next life. But I don't think that was a smart move. I don't think it was a smart move. And I have seen things like that happen throughout my life. And it doesn't end well. You should try to treat the children equally, love them all equally. That's what I think you should try to do. When you show favoritism, you are causing troubles. Number two, do not make a promise carelessly. If you do, it could cause a lot of trouble. Well, who did, in today's lesson, who did something carelessly? Yeah, Janie. Esau? No, not no. Esau. Careless. Somebody gave their word carelessly. Yes, Rosemary. Was it Jacob? No, I mean Isaac. 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 You know, he he had doubts about who this was. He said, your voice sounds like Jacob, but your skin feels like Esau and the meat tastes like Esau's deer meat and, and you smell like Esau. But he had doubts. Why would you give all of your property? Why would you give all of your inheritance and your, and your special blessing to someone if you didn't know for sure who they were? You shouldn't do such a thing. When something is really important, you should take your time. Uh, what is the biggest promise you're ever going to make in your life? Lena? Marriage. Marriage. You're going to promise to be faithful and true to this person until death do you part. Don't you think you should be very careful? You should be very, very careful. Some people get married way, way too casually. They don't know who they're marrying. Really? I, I knew a lady once. She met a guy and she married him three weeks later. And she was divorced three months later. That wasn't very bright, was it? <laughs> they call that a rash decision. You don't want to make rash decisions. You want to carefully think about things, especially when they're so important. Um, I'll tell the story. It'll drive the point home. But you all know, you all know the person. It's Aunt Ruthie, Aunt Rue. She met a guy in Columbus, dated him for a year and a half, and she was going to marry him. His name was Matthew. And um, they were only two months from their wedding day. And Ruthie said, 
she asked me, she said, are you okay with everything, Dan? I said, yeah, except one thing. I said, I think Matthew lied to you when he said he was on the Cleveland State basketball team and that he played in the NCAA tournament because I had been asking him for the last year and a half, two years, you know, bring me a videotape. I'd like to see it. And he'd always say, oh, I forgot it. Oh, it's in the other car. It's at my parents' house. And, and I just thought, no way. And, and then one day they were playing basketball outside the house and he couldn't play very good at all. And I thought, there is no way he played for a college team. So I told Ruthie, I said, I think he lied to you about that. And Ruthie said, well, we're going to find out. So the next day was a Monday. I called Cleveland State and she called Cleveland State. And we both got the same answer. I talked to a coach there, an athletic director. And I said, have you ever had a guy by that name at your school? He said, nope. I said, has your basketball team uh, ever gone to the NCAA tournament? He said, nope, we've never been there, not even once. So the guy was a liar. So Ruthie and I both found out and Ruthie talked to him and that evening and she said, what's up? You lied to me. Oh, he said, when I first met you, you were so nice and so pretty. He said, I wanted to impress you. So I told you you know, that I had played college basketball and I was in the NCAA tournament, you know. He said, I just wanted to impress you. Well, what question should be in your mind? Lena? Why did he never end up telling her that he lied? That's a good question, but there's another question that should be in your mind or should have been in Ruth's mind. What else has he lied about? There you go. What else did you lie to me about? And you know what? He had lied about everything. He had said that he was in graduate school at Ohio State, and he wasn't. He said he had a job at UPS and he worked part time while he's going to school, but he didn't have a job like that. He said all kinds of things. He had lied about just about everything in his life he had lied about. So what did Ruth have to do? That's it, Janie. She had to call it off, which she did immediately because in marriage, you have to be able to trust the person. If you And he said, oh, I won't lie to you anymore. Wow, maybe he's lying, you know? You, you, you're done. When you lie to people, you have broken trust and nobody can trust you. This is why you never want to become a liar. You become a liar and no one can ever trust you again. Because they'll think, well, maybe they're lying again. So she broke it up. And thankfully, that was great. Now she ended up with a wonderful husband, and wonderful kids and everything. But she almost made a promise too carelessly. When you make promises to people, and even smaller stuff, if, if you tell your friends, oh, yeah, Saturday, we'll go to the ball game. I'll drive. We'll go to the ball game and, and do this or that. And then Saturday comes and you don't show up and you got a better invitation and you went somewhere else. That going to make your friends happy? No. They're going to be very upset with you. Like, well, what kind of friend am I? As soon as you got a better invitation, you dumped me and you went with them. When you make a promise, you should keep it. Now, here's how, and when you're a parent someday, your kids, they're always wanting you to do stuff, you know. And as a parent, you said, okay, we will take you to the fair on Sunday afternoon. We'll go to the fair. 
Well, I would say it like this to my kids. I'd say, well, I hope to take you to the fair on Sunday afternoon. I can't promise for sure, but it's my plan to take you there. But you never know. Something could come up. You know, another kid could get really sick and you have to stay home and take care of the sick kid and you take, can't take the other kids to the fair. You, you never know. So I would always, I, I would never make it a promise. I would always just say, I plan to do this and hopefully our plans will come true. Okay? That's a good piece of advice. And then the children understand when, it, when and sometimes when things fall through, the kids will understand. But if you just like, I absolutely guarantee you I'm going to do this. And then you don't do it. That doesn't go over so well. Uh, number three, the anguish of Esau is a figure of the anguish of all sinners. Those who carelessly throw away eternal life will be eternally sad. That's right. I've already said that. Number four. The stairway to heaven in Jacob's dream is a figure of the Catholic Church. How is that stairway or that ladder a figure of the Catholic Church? Well, each step is like one of the sacraments. And we, you know, we get baptized, we're confirmed, we receive Holy Communion, we go to confession over and over, we receive Holy Communion again, and, and, and then we have the anointing of the sick before we die. There are a lot of steps. The sacraments are like steps that help us get to heaven. And those are part of the church. Okay, day 26. We continue our story. Anybody have questions or comments before we go to day 26? Now, re remember, guys, you're part of this class, too. And you can always raise your hand. You can always... Uh, jump in and, and make a comment, ask a question. I, I always enjoy that. Day 26, let's run through the story. Who were Laban's daughters? Well, La Uncle Laban had two daughters, Leah and Rachel. Describe each. Leah had lovely eyes. Rachel was well-formed and beautiful. Who did Jacob love? Rachel. Leah was the older one. Rachel was the younger one. I guess Leah had pretty eyes, but Rachel was, woohoo, she was real good looking. And um, uh, Jacob says he falls in love with Rachel. He wants to marry Rachel. How long did Jacob agree to work for Laban in order to marry Rachel? In those days, you had to ask dad, you know, dad, can I marry your daughter? And and you had to pay him. It was called a dowry. And so he didn't have anything to pay with. So uh, Uncle Laban says, well, uh, if you work for seven years on my farm, I'll let you marry Rachel. He says, okay, I'll work for seven years for her. What did the time seem like and why? There's a beautiful verse in the Bible there. It says, the seven years seemed like a few days because of his love for Rachel. Oh, isn't that nice? We got a little love story here, baby. Um, it's true. It's true. When you're in love, time flies. Um, you kids are young, uh, and you know, um, well, Paul's a little older and I don't know who else is watching this video, but, um, someday I hope you all fall in love. Oh my goodness. Falling in love is so much fun. Uh, it's just great. I, when I was in high school and college, I fell in love all the time. I had a crush on this girl and that girl and this girl and that girl. I was endless. But they kept 
dumping me. They kept breaking up. I got dumped more times in a gravel truck, you know. Um, <laughs> thank you, Jane. I, I can see the sympathy in your face. Um, but um, it certainly was fun falling in love. And I understand what it means when it says the, the years seem like a few days. Someday, you guys will have jobs, careers, vocation. What kind of career or what kind of job should you choose? Well, I have a piece of advice. There's an old saying, it says, do something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Have you ever, have in your chores or in your homework, if, have you ever had a subject or homework or some kind of work you just hated? It's just like, I hate this. But you got to do it. You got to do that homework or you got to do that chore. And maybe it takes an hour. Maybe it takes a day. Maybe it takes a week. For me, it was a lifetime. I hate cows. I hate milking cows. And I had to get up every single day of my life at 5 a.m., seven days a week, 365 days a year, 366 on leap year. Uh, it, it was bad. And I had to go out there and milk those cows every morning and every evening. Oh, I hate cows. The only time I like a cow is when they're at McDonald's and they're between uh, two slices of bun. Uh, but um, yeah. yeah, Lena. How much cow is actually in a McDonald's burger? One fourth of one pound, quarter pounder. That's the quarter pound burger. The, the other burgers are smaller, but why even mess with them? Uh, <laughs> well, how much of that burger meat is meat? <laughs> it's it's one hundred percent beef. That's what they say. Uh, hmm. Hey, don't be dogging on McDonald's. I've got good friends who own McDonald's restaurants. And so I say nothing but good things about McDonald's. Uh, anyway, if you've ever had a job that you really hate or a subject that you really hate, it, it just seems like it's forever. It seems like the work is drudgery, which is just not fun. But maybe there is some work that you really enjoy. Uh, and it really doesn't seem like work. Maybe there's a subject that you just love and you would read it and study it. I mean, I know Paul loves politics. You know, studying politics or reading about politics or hearing about politics is not drudgery for Paul. He loves this stuff. And so... My advice to you would be, as you grow older, you know, think about your life and think, what do I like? What do I enjoy? What do I love? And follow that. Sadly, what do a lot of people go after? You got it, Janie. Say the answer so we have it on audio. Money. Money. There are people who simply say, I want to be a doctor or an attorney or a businessman. And they just want to make money. And, and there's nothing wrong with making some money and making a living. There's nothing wrong with it. But do you really want a doctor operating on you whose only goal is to make money? I don't, I don't. I think a man should become, or a woman should become a doctor because they want to bring healing to people. I think you should become an attorney because you want to see justice done. Um, 
you want to be a businessman because you want to provide a good product or service to your customers. It's not just about money. If you make life just about money, you will be unsatisfied with your life. Guaranteed. Back to the story. He worked seven years and it seemed like a few days. And then they had a wedding and I don't know, they must have, you, you know how the bride has a veil? They must have used, uh, I don't know, uh, denim or uh, canvas or something because they, they had the wedding ceremony and then when they go to their tent that evening, she takes off her wedding dress and says, it's the older sister, it's Leah. What? Yeah, Lena. Why does why does um, Lot say that he has to have his older daughter married first? Laban. That part. Why, why does Laban yes. say that? He said, "Oh, it's our tradition." He said, "It's our custom that the older daughter gets married first. So he wasn't going to let him marry Rachel. He had to marry Leah first. What? I don't know. It's pretty crazy how he doesn't know who's under the veil. But, um, you know, I think it kind of serves Jacob right. Why would I say that? Yeah, Lucy? He did the exact same thing to his dad. You're right, Lucy. You have a good mind. You have a good mind. He did the same thing to his dad. He tricked his dad into thinking he was somebody else. And now he gets tricked into marrying Leah when he thought it was Rachel. Yep. Yes, sirree. You, you, as, as grandma... As Grandma Ann used to say, you play those games, you win those prizes. You know, he tricked others, and now he got tricked. Well, Laban says, you got to work seven more years if you want to marry Rachel. Oh, man. So he worked seven more years. And he... And then he got to marry Rachel. Um, what did Jacob have to do for Laban in order to marry Rachel? He worked seven more years. Number eight, who did the Lord make fruitful? Leah, because he saw that she was unloved by Jacob. Well, Jacob didn't love Leah. He loved Rachel. And so here we have a problem, first of all. He's got two wives. You should not have two wives. That's bigamy. Uh, and then some people would have even more. That's called polygamy. And uh, God, in his wisdom, when he created the human race, he created Adam and Eve. It's one husband, one wife, until death do you part. That's God's plan. It's still his plan. I know in America, people can't figure that out anymore. And they're all messed up on what marriage is. But that's God's plan. And as Catholics, that's what we believe in. But again, the Ten Commandments haven't been given yet. Uh, they know they should be one husband, one wife. I mean, Adam and Eve, I'm sure, passed on that information. But uh, they've gotten kind of lost. And uh, Abraham, you know, had sex with his slave girl and he shouldn't have done that. So these patriarchs, they're not perfect people. You know, don't, don't get that in your head. They, they lie, they cheat. They're like just about everybody else that's ever lived on this earth. They're sinners too. 
So he has two wives, Leah and Rachel. Well, when you have two wives, you're not going to treat them both the same. And he loved Rachel. He didn't love Leah. And so Leah feels left out. So it says that God made Leah fruitful, meaning she started to have babies. And um, in their culture, I've told you this before, in their culture, women were considered low class, inferior, and they were good for one thing, to have babies, male babies for their husbands. And so Leah, got pregnant. She had a male baby, little boy. She had another boy. Oh, now she's feeling better about herself because she's not a complete dud. She felt like she was a complete dud before. Well, what happened then? Rachel, even though her husband loves her, Rachel is not having any babies. She has sex with her husband, but she never gets pregnant. And it goes year after year after year. Leah is having children, but Rachel isn't. So Rachel feels like a dud now. So what does she do? She does something very wrong. She says, Jacob, have sex with my slave girl. And I'll have babies through her. Who made the same mistake? Say it, Janie. Sarah. Sarah, that's right. Sarah and Abraham made the same mistake, and that caused a bunch of troubles between Ishmael and Isaac. Well, Jacob has sex with the slave girl, and she gives birth to a boy. And Leah says, you don't scare me. I am going to outdo you. Jacob, have sex with my slave girl, too. You can have sex with me. You can have sex with my slave girl. And so they're both having... And then we have this baby race. Jacob is having sex with four different women. His two wives and their two slave girls, Billa and Zilpha. And as the years go by, he ends up having 12 sons from the four different women. And um, yeah, 12 sons. And he'd had 10 sons. And wouldn't you know it, Rachel gets pregnant. After like a half a dozen years, after like six or seven years, he's having babies with all these other women. Rachel finally gets pregnant and she gives birth to a little boy and his name is, he's going to be the next big character in the Bible. Rosemary. Joseph. Joseph. As you better know that, Rosemary. That's your daddy's name. Um, he's going to be Joseph and he's going to be the next big character we'll read about in the Bible. And then Rachel got pregnant again, and she gave birth to boy number 12, and his name is Benjamin. And she will die in childbirth. She died giving birth to Benjamin, Rachel did. And that's all the children that uh, Jacob had. Uh, Benjamin was the youngest. Lena, your question. Did, uh, did Jacob have any daughters? I think there was one. I think, uh, I, I think Tamar, I think was the only girl. I think I'd have to go back and look it up. It's not of any great consequence. I'm sad to say, but, um, uh, the 12 boys are what's important, and that's who we're going to read about. But I think he might have had one girl named Tamar, I think. Um, so um, where did God tell Jacob to settle and build an altar? Bethel. What new name did God give to Jacob? Israel. And what did God promise to give to Jacob? 
land and descendants. So after, after some time, after many years, about 20 years actually, um, Jacob is going to decide to go back to the land of Canaan. All these babies are being born up in Haran, which is north of the land of Canaan. And eventually, Jacob and his wives and his uh, children, they're all going to go. And, and by the way, he became very prosperous. Working for his uncle Laban, he, he gained a lot of sheep and goats and cattle he became very prosperous and so he decides he's going to go back to the land of canaan and live there in the promised land on his way back he has a dream he wrestles with an angel the angel gives him a new name israel israel means to wrestle with god isra to wrestle and l e l god to wrestle with god it's, it's, God gives people new names to indicate a new calling or a new vocation in life. And he's coming back to the promised land where he's going to establish uh, the Hebrew people there in the land of Canaan. And they will start to grow in numbers. Our spiritual lesson, number one, love makes work a joy. If we do everything in life in a spirit of love and offering it up to God, we will find great joy in life. Also, seek out the vocation in life that God has for you because there you will find the most joy. It is foolishness to pursue making money as your vocational goal. What will God call you to do? I don't know. God has a different plan for all of us. And some people will make a lot of money in their life, but that really shouldn't be their goal. I, I had a friend once who was very rich. And he was very good at being a businessman. He started a business from almost nothing. And he was really good at it. Today, I don't think he's a billionaire, but he's close. I know that about 15 years ago, he said that one of his goals was to give away a million dollars a day. And I don't think he has achieved his goal yet of giving away a million dollars a day, but he does give away millions and millions and millions of dollars. And, you know, when he was younger, I talked to him about money. And he said, Henry, he said, this is God's gift to me. He said, Henry, you're, you're a good teacher and, and you have your gifts from God. He said, I just make money. <laughs> He said, I'm a, I'm a good businessman. He said, everything I do, he just, he said, it goes great. And I make tons of money. I said, that's fine. Just as long as you're not selfish with it, as long as you're generous with it, that's a great gift to have. You can do a lot of good. And he actually employs, last I heard, he had four people on a team and their whole job was to give away his money. That's all they do. Uh, that's their job. But he wants to make sure the money is given to good charities, places where it's going to do good. And so that's what these people do. They, they check out all these different places where you know, people are wanting to have donations to make sure that his money is serving the kingdom of God. But what are you going to do? I don't know. Like I said before, don't just chase after money. Try to do what God wants you to do. When I was younger, God told me to, to go to laymen and teach religion. Well, that doesn't pay very much. And, uh, but that's what God told me to do. I have survived. I mean, mom and I, you know, we made it. We're 68 years old. All of our kids are raised. 
And we always had just enough money. I mean, we really had to be very careful. We could never spend a, a nickel too much. But we made it. We did it. We, we have, we, you know, we, we took care of what we had to take care of. And so that's great. I look back now and, I, and I'm very happy that I obeyed God and I taught those classes for 40 years. And that, that was my calling. That was my vocation. So whatever God calls you to, it, that's what's going to make you the happiest. I, I look back now and I loved my teaching. Teaching in high school, I loved it. I love the students. I love teaching. Um, I love teaching about Jesus and, and, and the Lord. Uh, it's just been wonderful. I would have never chosen it. I, I would have never chosen it for myself. But that's what God chose for me. That's what he told me what to do. And he told me that in my prayer. Someday I'll tell you how that happened. But um, the point today is I found such great happiness in life doing what God has told me to do. Same thing will be true for you. So you need to pray and let God guide you throughout your life to do his will, and that's where you'll find happiness. Number two, God cares about all of our hurts, and he will help us like he helped Leah when she felt unloved. It said Leah felt unloved. She, she felt like her husband didn't love her, and so God made her fruitful and gave her children. So many of us have hurts. I taught high school kids for 40 years. Every kid in high school feels hurt some way, somehow. By a parent, by a friend, by an enemy, by a coach, by a teacher, you name it. Everybody has hurts. We should uh, bring our hurts to God. When we're brokenhearted, we should pray and ask the Lord to help us. And God cares. God cares about you. I told that story, I think, last lesson about how I asked the Lord, do you care that I don't have a date? Remember that one? You know, and God showed me that he cares. You know, for a young person, that's kind of a big deal, whether you got a date or whether you got a boyfriend or a girlfriend or something, that's kind of a big deal. And sometimes, you know, we, we, uh, we wonder if God really cares about us, but he does. He does. You pray, you ask God to help you out and be patient and he will. So God cares about us, and he cares about everything in your life. Now, that, that's the point I'm trying to make. If you're struggling with something, I don't care how little of a thing it is, God cares about it. He knows everything about you, and he cares about everything about you. He won't always make life easy. No. In life, we will struggle, we'll have pain, we'll have suffering, no doubt about it. But he will be with you in it. He'll be with you in it. And that makes all the difference. And number three, God has a way of evening the score. Jacob tricked his father, but he was later tricked by Laban. Yeah, you don't have to go out and take revenge on people. Just leave it up to God. These people who do bad things, if they don't repent, don't worry. God has a way of evening up everything. You don't have to go out and play God and take revenge on somebody who did something. 
Just give it up, put it into God's hands. You say, Lord, I forgive them. But, uh, and hopefully they will repent and, and hopefully God can forgive them too. But God has, he has a way of evening the score out. You know, Jacob tricked his dad, but then he got tricked by Laban. Well, that brings us to um, day 27. And at the start of that lesson, I put like an update to, you know, because you students are not reading. You're just reading a few highlights. You're not reading the whole thing. Jacob returned to Canaan and became friends with Esau again. Yes. When Jacob came back to Canaan, he was worried. Is Esau still hating me? It's been like 20 years. Is Esau still going to want to kill me? Well, what happened was Esau, Jacob left. Esau inherited everything. And he did really good too. He became very prosperous. And so Esau, he didn't care anymore. And when Jacob showed up, they gave each other a big hug. They hadn't seen each other for 20 years and everything was good. That's nice. I like to see a happy family. Um, on that trip home, Jacob has that episode where he wrestles with an angel and he gets a new name, Israel. And that's something from now on when you're reading in the story, when you're reading in Genesis, sometimes it will say Jacob and sometimes it will say Israel. It's the same guy. In one paragraph, they will call him Israel. In the next paragraph, they'll call him Jacob. It's the same guy. Don't let that get you confused. Many students like, who is this? It's the same guy, okay? He was called Jacob, now he's called Israel. But he's not always called Israel. Sometimes they still call him Jacob. And so, same guy. Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin. That was the youngest of the 12 boys. And Jacob, whose name is also Israel, has 12 sons. Each one's going to grow up and get married and have children. And we're, these are going to be the 12 tribes of Israel. And of course, the main one, the next important person is going to be Joseph. Hmm. Here's our last question. Why do you think Joseph is going to be the favorite son out of the 12. Lena? Because he was the firstborn from Rachel. His favorite wife. That's right. Firstborn of his favorite wife. So even though he's number 11, chronologically, he's going to be treated like the firstborn son, which is going to drive his older brother's crazy. Once again, this family favoritism is not good. Uh, and so we are going to pick up the story with Joseph. It's uh, Genesis chapter 37. And, and that's, that's where we're going to start. And we'll do uh, third, we'll do a lesson. What is that? That's lesson day 27. And then day 29, we'll be working on those on Tuesday. So you should be reading those. And if you're, if you're doing your homework, you should be filling out your study guides there, your, your reading guides. And, and, and you know, there's tests that go along with all of this. If you were in my high school class, you'd be quizzed every day, uh, but uh, you're not. This is a wonderful Zoom class and uh, you can do as much work or as little as your parents tell you. Remember, obey your parents. <laughs> okay, it is so much fun talking to you guys.
I hope you have a wonderful weekend. God bless you.